טוב, תודה. בעולם ההפוך שלנו, ליאור צריכה לדבר באנגלית ואני אווירית, לא, אני צוחק, אין בעיה. It's a pleasure to, to talk to you, and I know that people are going to be coming in, which is fine. We'll start slowly and move on faster as more people come in. But I think, um, especially, I love to talk in surgical and, pathologic, and pathology audiences because really I think that those groups of physicians, sometimes more than medical oncologists, get it because they do the surgery, they do what they think and they hope is definitive surgery to cure patients. And then unfortunately, they, see, they hear the results of what happened, that the tumor has recurred, the patient is in a metastatic setting. And unfortunately, the truth is that even today, when you develop metastatic disease, with very few exceptions, it's a death sentence. It's only how much longer you can stay alive or what else can be done. To that extent, what I'm going to talk to you about today is really, I think, the epitome of personalization of refuai sheet, essentially, because it, what it allows you to do is to develop, essentially, a mouse avatar, which essentially is a model that, is, that replicates the biology of the tumor, and most importantly, replicates the, set, the drug sensitivity of, of the tumor. Uh, just as a disclosure, um, about uh, five years ago, I started a spin-off company called Champions Oncology. We do provide some of this mouse avatar work, both in Israel and abroad, uh, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, as a service, so you need to know that. Uh, I am the chairman of the company um, and an advisor to the company. Um, so this is the traditional model, and to make a long story short, we all realize what happened. You have this complicated tumor here, which has all these different things. It has heterogeneous tumor cells. is a very hot area now. They're not all clonal. It's a polyclonal tumor. Um, it has certain shared clonal events. It has the stroma. There was a very nice talk just here about what happens if you take the peritoneum of a patient with pancreatic cancer and mix it with the cancer cells of a pancreatic cancer patient. And what they showed is exactly what we've known for a long time, which is if you mix the stroma from a cancer with the actual cancer cells, you change the sensitivity to drugs. And that's really the essence, that you need to have the entire microenvironment present to be able to correctly predict uh, what's going to happen. What happened with these old models is they would take them and grow them on plastic, eventually got monoclonal cell lines, inject them into mice. It was nice because you could send the cells to different areas and they could test them in different places, but you really lost all the important components components of that microenvironment. And the most important thing from a clinical point of view is that you lost essentially the ability to predict what the sensitivity of this tumor or tumor cells was going to be to different uh, drugs. So when we talk about a tumor graft, uh, in many places in the world they're called PDX, personalized derived xenografts. I don't like that word because the truth is it's a graft from the tumor. There's no manipulation or passaging or anything else that's usually done with a xenograft. It maintains all these different cellular components, including the heterogeneous cells, uh, the stroma, the blood vessels. And I'll tell you something which was fascinating. For a long time, I didn't even know that we actually maintained the lymphocytes, the TILs, the infiltrating lymphocytes that are in the tumors. There's a very nice paper that just came out in Cancer Discovery on a group that's working on ovarian cancer PDXs, and they showed that the lymphocytes, the actual infiltrating lymphocytes, live for 12 weeks in the mouse that has the tumor. They go in and out of the tumor. They go to the reticular endothelial system. They circulate and come back into the tumor. Just to give you an idea of how much of a microenvironment is created here, and one of the reasons we know we can test antibodies, small molecules, and other biologics as well in these models. So the, the data is just growing tremendously. Just want you to know that last year there was 2,900 publications using these types of models. So it's no longer a research tool. It has completely penetrated the pharmaceutical industry, which is incredibly important because it's going to help us develop better drugs. This is, I'm just going to give you two quick slides. This is histopathology. What happens if you look at the primary tumor? from a patient, and you also look at the graft, okay? So for pathologists, they want to see that it looks the same, and you can see here, this is essentially the P0, which is the initial implantation. This is after the second passage in breast, ovarian, etc., and you see that they're identical. 
this is another group from Italy that does a similar type of work in colorectal cancer. And I just want to see you because their study is very nice. Look at the stroma and the neoplastic cells, the stroma and the neoplastic cells. You maintain the microenvironment. You maintain the three-dimensional structure. You maintain the important characteristics of crosstalk between the stroma and the tumor. All the autocrine and paracrine factors are important to maintain that tumor. And again, for drug sensitivity are maintained. This is at the expression level, just showing you that if you throw the tumor on an Affymetrix gene chip and just see what is the level of my genes at the RNA level, and you do the same thing with the graft, you get a 95% correlation. Essentially, another way of showing you at the molecular level that they're nearly um, identical. Uh, this is the way we currently do it, and there's been um, quite a few improvements over the last three years in, in doing this. Uh, I was just talking to somebody from South Korea who was here a second ago who said that their implantation rate when they tried it was much lower. Uh, part of the reason, and I'll talk to you about our implantation rate now, our take rate is 70% is or higher, is that we have a very, very specific goal in mind, which is to make sure we establish the avatar for that patient so we've really optimized the approach to doing that. When you're doing it in the academic setting just to establish a model, whether you lose a model or don't lose a model is not the end of the world. For us, it's important because I'm just going to show you we give back results to patients when we do them as individualized avatars. The surgeons are the most important component of this. We need to get fresh tissue. That is the major limitation of this approach. Unlike sequencing, which we're going to talk about briefly, you cannot, do some, you cannot get a piece of tissue after it's been removed. We need to get it fresh, ideally within the same day that we do it in the United States also by overnight Federal Express. In Israel, it's not an issue. Right? We can get it from anywhere you are in Israel. We can get it to central laboratory and implant it. It's not a problem. Um, we need, we'd like to get, if it's an absolute, if it's surgery, about a cubic centimeter of tumor. If we get two biopsies, two core biopsies instead of a big piece of tumor, it's about a 50% take rate. If we get three to four core biopsies, we approach the same take rate as if we get a big piece of tumor. It takes about six weeks to engraft. Um, and, then, and then we call the physician and tell them that the graft is taking. We then do the expansion, which takes about another six weeks now. And it takes about three months before we're ready to do the testing. So that's the second limitation. The first one is we need fresh tissue. The second one is we need three months. If the patient's not going to live three to six months, don't send us the tumor or the biopsy. It's not going to make any difference. Then usually after that, four weeks later, we give you the results. So you can estimate now that the patient's going to have to undergo one more line of therapy. We only use this in second line and beyond, so your patient will go under whatever standard therapy that is. If they have metastatic disease that goes through first-line therapy, at second-line therapy beyond, we're ready to give you um, the information in terms of what is the best uh, therapy. This is just a quick summary to show you what I just talked about. Up to 12 hours, we still have a very high take rate, which is about 70%. If you go past, uh, if you go past four to 48 hours, you get zero. So that's the time. 24 to 36 is our limit. Once you get to 48, you get nothing. So that is why we need to get the fresh tissue. Our take rates, again, are 70 to 80 percent. And I just want to show you what's happened just in the last two years. Our, it used to take us six months to get to testing. Now, routinely, we get to testing after three months. So again, this has shortened the time and made it more available and, and, and much more useful uh, for patients in the clinic. Uh, this is our experience now have over 500 implantations now. So our experience is getting broad across the world in terms of what we were doing. We actually broke it down now into categories, and I think the first one has got to be a shock to everybody. The most common tumor that gets implanted in our service is sarcoma, which is amazing when you think about how rare sarcoma is. Sarcoma makes up more than 10% of all the tumors that get implanted. And if you think about it, right, there's a lot of tissue. Patients always go through surgery. They're very different. Sarcomas can be divided even morphologically into seven or eight groups, and maybe more. The genetics are poorly understood. There is no drug or drug combination that has more than a 15% response rate. All those things tend to push patients to us quickly. And again, a lot of one of our major validation trials right now is in sarcoma. Colorectal cancer is number two. So again, many of you that are surgeons in colorectal area, again, oftentimes what we see in colorectal cancer is either very aggressive primary lesions are sent to us when there's a lot of positive lymph nodes, or we get also patients in the metastatic setting. You all know those patients that did well for a year, then they recur with two or three liver mets. You, maybe you take out the liver mets, or you just, and then you give us one, we implant it, and then they go on through further therapy. And then all the way down, we're seeing more and more triple negative breast, pancreatic cancer, lung ovarian, all the way down. We've done basically every tumor type. We're even getting into leukemias and lymphomas, so that's a new area for us as well. 
So, so this is just to give you an overview of our positive predictive value, which is 92%. There is no in vitro test that comes anywhere as close to that, right? I mean, if you look at traditional growing them on plastic, trying to just see what may work, most of those are close to 50%. If you, you know, in some cases, you can get to 55. That is what drives us, okay? And this is just a summary of all the data. You know, retrospectively, we looked. That means that we're looking in parallel to see what happens to patients in 48 out of 49 cases, which is 98%. Keep in mind. When we're doing that, that means that we're looking at first-line therapy, essentially, because we have the tumor, the patient is getting first-line therapy, we're seeing if it's working in the graft, that's essentially almost 100%. When you're looking at the 83%, now you're looking at second line and beyond, so even though it's nearly identical to the primary tumor, you see a little bit of a fall-off because simply there are issues related to heterogeneity and changes that probably initiate what it is, but overall, in terms of our overall uh, predictive value, it's 92%. We don't obviously push to to get therapies that we think will not work. We, we, there are patients that get those therapies. Maybe we give them the answer the day after they started their chemotherapy or something. We're nearly 100% in the negative predictive value, which is obviously quite reasonable given, given the fact that it's an in vivo assay. I wanted to show you this because I think even Lior hasn't seen this. It's a very important slide. We, we are now, this model is as good as what you put into it. Okay, so when you see these lines, you know this is that initial implantation at 200 cubic millimeters. This is the normal tumor, and then this is drug one, two, three, whatever. We all want to see this, and I'm going to show you some examples of this. The tumor starts out as a piece, gets smaller, and maybe is even cured in the mouse. That predicts very nicely for a complete remission or partial remission in the patient. But you have to have a drug that does that. <laughs> right? There has to be a drug or a drug therapy that actually will produce this result. What we see a lot of is straight lines or the fact that it's slowed down. What we can guarantee you, I think, is that you will get the best choice. If you give us three drugs, we'll tell you which one's better. If we can test eight or 12, we may find the home run or the one that's really amazing and will do that. But it, that's why I'm saying it depends on what you put in. If you don't have a drug that works, the model's going to tell you it doesn't work. It's not going to find a miracle, which is one of the reasons why it's important to integrate um, the PDX or the tumor graph system also with any other molecular information we have which I'm going to talk to you about briefly including sequencing and molecular analysis and everything else because it helps guide you to give you the best choices so that then you can test them empirically. So this is the first case that we had at Hopkins, and you know it's it's the one that you know it is one of these miracle cases. This is a patient with metastatic pancreatic cancer. This is the control. This is gemcitabine. We had two very good choices. One is minomycin C and cisplatin, nice straight line, even going down. The patient failed at, with metastatic disease after gemcitabine. I just want to show you very quickly the protein level of CA19-9. He fails on gemcitabine, goes from 10,000 to 100,000. After four cycles of minomycin C, normalizes, recurs two years later with metastatic pancreatic cancer, then goes on cisplatinum and goes into another complete remission. He lived with two CRs, metastatic pancreatic cancer, five years. We actually afterwards, when sequencing came about, sequenced this tumor and found that it had a PALB2 mutation, which is part of the BRCA1, BRCA2 pathway. Again, we didn't have this information ahead of time. If we would have, we could have even more easily signaled in which were the drugs that would work. But these are the kinds of patients that drive us all to, to try to find you know, answers and things that can really make a, a big difference. You can read this yourself. You know, People always ask me after I see this talk, how did you get to that drug or drug combination? When you look at each individual journey, it looks like hard. But when you look at what happened to the patient historically, it makes a lot of sense. You know, we go through, you know, what are the genetic and molecular information we have? What are the standard agents that have already been tried? What are off-label agents that are often active at a low frequency? And then investigational agents, and I'll show you how that works, which is really nice when we get investigational agents in. And in the end, I just want you to understand, we're depending on the treating physician. That interaction between some of the treating physicians is what really allows us to do the testing and then for the, the physician to do that. Believe it or not, we have had one or two cases where we had really good results. The oncologist was not on board and they didn't give him the treatment. So that's, you know, you have to have somebody that believes in doing this and wants to do this. Otherwise, you lose. There's many places where you can lose along the way. This is just to give you an example in sarcoma because, you know, I talked about sarcoma and we're getting a lot of it. And you can see here what's happening. There's a lot of young patients. Every one of them is weird. Every one of them you end up looking up exactly to figure out when's the last phase two study that was done. And that's what drives these patients to us. You can see in the previous treatment, there's a lot of previous treatment. I just want to point out 1207 is a Ewing's boy, nine-year-old boy. I'll show the end, a beautiful newspaper article in the United States about him. He was dying. He had the graft. His physician does one study at a time. 
If there's a phase two that's available in Ewing's, he tests it. If it's positive, he sends him to the phase two study. And twice now, this kid has lived and has done very well because of that. Again, the avatar model predicts both standard agents. You can read them down there. I'll look at 1119. Regorafenib is approved for colon cancer. It's a new anti-angiogenic that also affects other pathways. We tested it in this lipo liposarcoma for 56-year-old male. He did very well um, and again went into a PR for, for uh, a period, more than six months uh, after that treatment. Here's just the example so you get more of a flavor. I just want to show you that again there's volume. It's a piece of tissue that's implanted that has volume in the mouse. Okay, If you don't do anything it grows very quickly. You can see in red that's what you want to see. This is a common combination used in sarcoma. Uh, gemcitabine and docetaxel, it's clear that this patient is going to have a very nice response. And the patient had a nice PR, almost a CR, for nine months after taking this treatment. Again, best choice. This is one that you might have used for sarcoma, but now you know that it's going to work. The patient recurs. Now we do a second set of treatment, okay? Now you can see here that there are actually a few drugs that work. At the bottom is aribulin, okay? and also adromycin. The physician made a very simple choice. Adromycin is in, was approved by insurance company, aribulin wasn't. He gave me adromycin, the patient is doing very well with recurrent disease. Aribulin is still there, but there's issues related to who's going to pay for the aribulin, right? The same issues you have in Israel. So again, th these are the types of things that you have to weigh in when you look at drugs, but it's nice to see that this tumor is sensitive and has choices, right? That you have good choices that you can give uh, the patient. Here's a breast cancer case. Again, we're seeing more and more of these triple negatives that are coming to us. This patient is one that I knew personally. She was 39 years old and a physician at Hopkins. It's interesting because when she developed metastatic disease, she immediately wanted to have a graft done. She had a lymph node removed. We grafted the tumor. She had failed her septin, even though she was uh, HER2 new positive. Um, and you can see here, we actually did studies on the graft. You can see here that when we stain with the antibody, you see nice staining, but it's all cytoplasmic. You don't see it on the membrane. That's one of the reasons why I think the Herceptin didn't work. And she really was in tough shape. I mean, had gone through all the standard therapies. Nothing had worked. Um, we showed that it was the smaller hair to new and, and that there was a study that had just come out at ASCO, this is about two years ago, that in patients that didn't respond to Herceptin, you could use lapatinib. It's a small molecule that targets both EGFR and hair to new so in combination with Zolota, we saw this graph. Now, if you see this graph, you can see here that, you know, it's a little, it's a little bit worse than a straight line. It goes up a little bit. But that's all she had. That's, this, is all we were, this is all we could find that had any activity. And she went into a stable disease for five months, which is what you would predict from this line. Again, it's the best choice that we had available. The important thing when you have a graph, though, is that you stay alive a little bit longer, and she did. And then when we were able to test it again... We saw that she had a very nice response in red to trastuzumab and venerelbin. Now, that was a new combination that had come out. I think what happens is the venerelbin actually breaks up the tumor cells because it's sensitive to it, exposes the protein, and now you get the ADCC response from the antibody. Anyway, after trying all kinds of experimental therapies, again, she's a physician at Hopkins, and seeing that everything else had failed, we found the best choice for her. She only lived a little more than two years with a metastatic disease, but both of her choices came from, from tumor graft or xenograft directed uh, therapy. Here's just another case, and, and again, that just shows you what it's like to have this in the bag, to have this graft growing, okay? This is a woman, uh, 43 years old, with triple negative breast cancer. And like everybody else, she had definitive, you know, she had definitive uh, neoadjuvant and postadjuvant therapy with ACT, the standard drugs. Everybody thought everything was fine, okay? We were very nervous because when we took this graft, okay, you see, I don't know if you see the growth rate, but I just want to show you that at day 14, okay, this tumor is twice the size. It, it started growing within two weeks in the lab and started growing like a monster. And we told the treating physician, look, I know everything looks okay, but this tumor looks like it's going to be very, very aggressive. He said, look, everything's fine. We've done surgery. We've done, given her adjuvant chemo. There's nothing else we can do. He said, yeah, but when she recurs, she could recur and die very quickly because this tumor is growing very fast. It wasn't, it wasn't even three months 
Okay? It wasn't even three months since she finished her adjuvant therapy where she started to get recurrent disease. We had done the testing. We showed that she had a very nice response with gemcitabine, carbo, and avastin. And you can see how nice the curve is. She actually went into a near complete response you know, for more than six months. So again, it allowed us to anticipate both the fact that it would regrow and also to give us a therapy that we could give her. I just want to end um, for the next last 10 minutes with a couple of trying to integrate the abundance of molecular information that's available to us. As you know, complete sequencing of all the genes or sequencing a certain number of target genes is becoming very, very important. Uh, we think in the United States will probably be approved either as a laboratory test or even potentially as a kit to the FDA within a year or so. So this is something that is now in hand. Uh, it's complex. You have to use a good company that knows how to do the bioinformatics and can give you the right information. I just want to show you three cases of the interaction between genetic sequencing or molecular information. You actually saw the first one, but it was after the fact, the pancreatic cancer with PLB2. So here's a patient with metastatic lung cancer, and this happens, and it's going to happen to a lot of your patients. We did complete sequencing. We found 20 beautiful somatic mutations. I have no idea how to treat any of the 20, okay? They're just in weird pathways, nothing common, no targeted drugs. You, you file it away in the next two or three years of the patients around. Hopefully you find something that eventually targets these pathways. But that's the beauty of doing such complete sequencing. Also the limitations that sometimes there's no drugs, which is one of the reasons why people are kind of homing in on this targeted panel where you know you have a drug or a pathway you can use. Okay, so in this case, this is the first case. We didn't have anything we could use, but we did have the graft. Uh, this is a patient who who had uh, actually an Israeli living in New Jersey who had metastatic disease that presented to the tibia and the leg, a very big tumor, very easy to take tissue. We grew it out. He went through standard therapy, and it, it really was, uh, was, uh, was, was quite amazing because you can see here that he had a beautiful response to gemcitabine and cisplatinum. Look at this right here. Very, very nice. Now, I was a bit scared because he went through standard platinum doublet with a limta and carbo plus avastin, which is the standard in the United States. It's not common to see a good response to platinum, even if it's cisplatinum after you failed a platinum doublet. We were nervous. We were so nervous that I actually took the control, th these mice that were still growing, and gave them the gem cyst, and they started to, the tumor started to shrink. So we went ahead and the, the patient pushed for it and actually went into a nine month CR by going on gem cyst after having failed a limta, carbo, and, and avastin. So again, just the predictive power, here the genetics didn't really uh, help us. It just shows you again what, what happened to the patient. Um, so here's another patient where we had some good choices. This is actually an Israeli patient who had done well on a renotecan. You can see here it's a very, very fast-growing tumor when it's not under control. But here there was a very nice triplet combination of renotecan, the limpton, the vast, and docetaxel, abraxin also worked. After failing single agent of renotecan, he went into a 13-month uh, complete remission on the triplet combination. We were doing well. Uh, we, got the resp we got actually back that he had a translocation of RET. But translocation of RET, though it's interesting and has been described, doesn't, there's drugs that are potentially active, but again, we don't know whether they're going to be active in this tumor. So we had the opportunity and the time to test different RET inhibitors and see if it actually would work. I just want to show you, this is just a quick summary instead of the graphs. I just want to show you that we tried various, various inhibitors, not only against RET, but an MCL1 inhibitor, JAK2 inhibitor. He had a bunch of other mutations. And these are all growing. Okay? Anything at zero means that there's no growth. Okay? So we had a little bit of growth on the abzatadinib, which is um, against MCL1. Uh, but we didn't really see anything with the venteritinib, which is supposed to be against RET. But we had a very nice response with the Braxin and Teresolimus, an mTOR inhibitor. And the patient here got best choice, despite the genetics, went on a drug that, that had the best treatment and went on to a six-month uh, PR. This is the one where it all comes together very nicely. This is genetics here are showing us in the metastatic colorectal cancer that the patient has both a PIK3CA mutation and a KRAS mutation. Now, if you look at the literature, many of you well know that KRAS is a big story, right? You don't give Herbitux, you don't give the, the EGFR antibody to patients that have the KRAS mutation. However, there are mutations and there are weaker mutations. Okay, the KRAS 13D mutation has been thought to potentially be a weaker mutation and not always predictive in terms of negative response to Herbitux. So I didn't want to show you all the curves here, but basically after the, f f the patient failed full fury, 
Um, we tried different combinations, and the only one that really worked was fulfluronox, but interestingly enough, the only one that gave us a flat line was fulfluronox for cetuximab. So here we saw an effect of cetuximab, even though there was a KRAS13 mutation, and though we were, again, if you would just see the molecular information without the graft, you would have never have given the Merbitux. So together, by doing the empiric testing and taking the molecular information, we have this information now. The patient is doing very, very well for more than six months on this therapy, and we have a PIKI3CA mutation. We're trying pyrofosine and other PIK3 inhibitors as potentially the next round of therapy. So again, nice interaction between the molecular analysis and the graft. And this is probably our best model, I think, in terms of putting it all together. This is a 72-year-old woman with metastatic ovarian cancer, very, very bad prognosis. She had failed cisplatinum, carboplatinum, alimta, doxyl, gemcitabine, nebraxin, and pretty much everything else. This is essentially a death sentence with metastatic ovarian cancer. But her model was growing in our, in, in, in our lab, and at that time, there was interest in MEK inhibitors downstream of KRAS, downstream of, of some of the signaling pathways. And um, a GSK, who was working with us on the other side, testing different models, said, look, this is really hot right now. We want any KRAS mutant model you have. Any KRAS mutant model that's growing today. So, well, we have a woman with ovarian cancer. It's not your melanoma, it's not your colon cancer, but it's an ovarian cancer right now if you want to test it tomorrow. So literally, they sent us the drug. We tested it, and you see here that this MEK inhibitor had just a beautiful response. Um, very clearly a downtrend. Clearly the tumor is shrinking. This is the other nice thing about it. In 22 days, we got compassionate use. They were more than interested in giving the drug to the patient. She got it, and she went into a PR for six months with nothing else working, was able to get the, the drug on compassionate use. Again, the interaction between the molecular biology, the graft, and, and the interaction of the pharmaceutical company. So they're very, like any tool, we're learning how to use it. There's a lot of uses, a lot of things we can do, and we're getting very excited about the potential. This is just uh, something that we... Um, uh, that we published at ASCO in 2013. If you take all the molecular information, genetic sequencing information, and a graft, in about 80% of patients, you can find one solution that will give you clinical benefit. And clinical benefit was defined as either a PR, a CR, or stable disease for more than six months. Um, and again, these are all patients in bad shape. These are patients with second line or beyond. The standard, uh, the standard response rate or stable disease rate in second line therapy for most metastatic cancer is 10 to 15%. So keep in mind here that you can bump that number up by taking the tools, including the mouse avatar and molecular information, and getting it up to a very high number, um, at least for one round of therapy. If you're talking about two rounds of therapy, it drops about 50%. About 50% of our patients will get two choices that they get to use in terms of the, uh, the metastatic uh, setting. I just want to show you the, the last thing, which is, look, I mean, obviously, we don't want to graft forever. We have 500 models. I want to get to five or 10,000 models, and we're already beginning to extract that information. That molecular information we're getting is eventually going to build an algorithm for us and the ability to predict which tumors will respond without having to test the drugs. But we need a lot of tumors. So this is really essentially a joint project, the Shituf Peula, essentially, between the patient and us. Give it, get it, let us get the model in. We'll bring the model inside, build the bioinformatics on it, but also benefit the patient. And obviously what we want to do is figure out whether a specific gene or gene signature can predict the specific response uh, to a drug. Uh, I just want to show you that uh, we've done this retrospectively. We've done this for KRAS and shown very nicely that we predict Herbitux. Here's one that we did for Tarsiva now. Um, this paper was published about six months ago. We just showed that a certain marker called MIX6, when it was low, predicted for Tarsiva resistance. We actually bent back into a clinical population after we found this in the graphs and showed the patients that had a low mix 6 years lived one year longer on Tarsiva even if they didn't have an EGFR mutation. And generally speaking, it's very hard to identify any patients that are going to benefit with metastatic lung cancer if they don't have the EGFR mutation. But here, again, by picking a marker out of our graphs, doing the bioinformatics, we were able to find a marker that could help predict uh, sensitivity to, to this drug. So just want to end uh, with this. Um, this right here is, the, is an Israeli that lives in Toronto. This is his wife. She's a physician. They've been working with us for about five years. He's one of those sarcoma patients that had all those different drugs and continues to do well. Get surgery, we resequence, we re-implant, we do more testing. They're extremely happy. In fact, they're drawing us. They want us to start a center in Toronto because they're very interested in doing it. Here's a nine-year-old boy with Ewing sarcoma. 
Okay, who, who very, that's the second one. This is uh, um, uh, in New Jersey, uh, who specifically, really, I think his life was saved, and he's gotten into two phase twos, and every time that he recurs, his physician at Sloan Kettering asked us if we could get him into another test, other new experimental agents. This is a New York Times article, which is just, again, summarizing what's going on. A lot of enthusiasm talking about mice, and, you know, we're getting publicity all over. As I said, it's already, it's already penetrated the pharmaceutical industry completely. Um, there are no pharmaceutical companies that don't use these models to some extent, and have, some have completely replaced the old models, which is good. Uh, and increasingly, you know, I think we're seeing more and more volumes of patients that want to establish their mouse avatar. It's a very nice tool. Just like any other tool, it's not perfect. It has its limitations. Fresh tissue, time until you have to wait. And the other one is that not yet covered by insurance. So one of the other issues that patients have to deal with is they still have to pay for this on their own. Um, that uh, We are running validation trials, as I said. We've started in ovarian cancer, sarcoma, and lung cancer just to show those differences in the more homogeneous population. And maybe, you know, maybe it'll be three years before we start looking at reimbursement in the United States. Thank you very much.